Hi everyone, it's Joe. Welcome to week four of PC Neurobiology in our online format. Today we're going to look at a paper by Stanley Prusner, and this is a continuation of the work by Gajazek, who thought that Kuru was caused by a slow-acting virus. Prusner was interested in trying to figure out what the infectious particle was, whether it was indeed a virus or some other type of molecule. And his work was criticized by the scientific community for many years because scientists bought into the slow-acting virus theory and didn't want to believe what Prusner eventually proved, which is Kuru and other related diseases are actually caused by a protein that he named prion. Uh, but eventually Stanley Prusner uh, proved that indeed it was a protein. That's what this paper argues. And eventually he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this work. So it's very interesting and I had an opportunity to hear him speak at the Marine Biological Laboratory as part of their Friday evening lecture series which occurs in the summertime. So I saw him about six or seven years ago. As we already know, based on Gajuzek's work, Kuru could be transmitted from human to chimpanzee and from chimpanzee to chimpanzee by taking diseased brain tissue, and grinding it up, and injecting it into the brain of the chimp. And it was thought that Kuru was transmitted from human to human through cannibalistic rituals. In this paper, Prusner starts out by talking about another form of a spongiform disorder similar to Kuru that occurs in sheep and goat called scrapie. So in the first part of the paper, Stanley Prusner tells a story about inoculating sheep in Scotland against looping ill virus. And what the farmers did is they took brain and spleen tissue from a sheep that died of looping ill virus. And of course, those tissues contain the virus. They grind the tissue up, and then they treat the tissue with formalin, which kills the virus, and then they inject that slurry into sheep so that the sheep's immune system will recognize this now dead form of the virus and build antibodies against the virus and, of course, create immunity within the sheep population. But it turns out that in the process of inoculating the sheep against looping ill, they also injected a second substance, unknowingly, that was also in the brain, or spleen, or both, from that original sheep, and that caused scrapie in the inoculated sheep population. So okay, along with Kuru, there are other forms of what are now known as prion diseases in humans. One is called Creutzfeldt-Jacobs disease, and of course we already know about fatal familial insomnia, which we're going to get to in tomorrow's lecture. There's scrapie in sheep and goats, there's mad cow disease in cows and so on, but these are all the exact same disease just in different organisms. It looks as though the disease can be transmitted through ingestion, that is cannibalism in the four tribe. Also mad cow disease is known to have been caused by cows eating diseased cow material. So it turns out that farmers take parts of the cow that can't be sold and they grind it back up into the feed of the cows. Um, and that's how mad cow disease was transmitted. We know that these diseases can be transmitted by injecting disease material into brain, human to chimp or chimp to chimp. We know that the disease can be transmitted by injecting disease material into the body cavity in the case of scrapie. And there are examples where Creutzfeldt-Jacobs disease has been transmitted from one patient to another patient through the surgical instrumentation. That is to say, uh, a brain surgery was done on a Creutzfeldt-Jacobs individual, and then that instrumentation, even though it's cleaned and sterilized, is used subsequently on other patients. In the process, the disease was transmitted from the original patient to the downstream patients. So it's a pretty scary thought. At any rate, what all of this shows is that whatever the infectious agent is, that it's quite resilient. And Prusner, 
set out to figure out what that infectious agent actually is. The paper by Prusner is a summary of a lot of work, decades of work by the scientific community in this general area. And in order to try to figure out what the infectious particle is, you have to try to biochemically purify it, which is what Prusner wants to do. The difficulty is that you have to have some sort of assay so that you can follow the particle through the purification procedure. So let me erase this. So, you know, if we were talking about kinesin, we can follow kinesin's purification through either the microtubule gliding assay, or you could do it by binding the material that you're purifying, the fraction of the purification material, um, bind it to glass beads and see if you can get the glass beads to move along the microtubule. So, for instance, what I'm, let's see here, what I mean to say is that if you took a sample and you put it over a sucrose step gradient, uh, like a 45, 15, 12, and then a supernatant, and you put the material on top of the sucrose and then spin it through high speed, of course we know that different materials are going to separate out into the different layers based on their density. It's a dense sucrose density gradient. And then you would literally have to test each fraction for kinesin in the in that example, in the kinesin example. And if you found kinesin in say the 45% layer, then you can you put a slide down in some microtubules and if they glide around on the surface of the glass or a glass bead incubated with the material moved along the microtubule, then you know kinesins in this particular fraction. And if it's not, if the movement doesn't happen in the presence of these three other fractions, you could throw those away and then you would continue your purification from the sample that contains the kinesin. You might then take this fraction, whoops, let's see here, and put it over a sizing column. We've talked about this before, that might have beads with holes in them that separate things based on their size. This was based on density. And now we're separating the sample, the components of the sample based on size. And we said that the small stuff goes into the bead and gets caught there for a little while and then comes out. The big stuff just can't make it in, goes around. And the medium stuff goes into some bigger holes and comes out a little faster than the small stuff that gets stuck in the nooks and crannies of the bead. At any rate, then if we collected fractions as the sample comes off of the column, you would have to test then each of these fractions for kinesin in this particular example. But still, not a very difficult assay. You just add the fraction to, let's say, the glass beads. And if there's kinesin present in the fraction, it binds to the glass bead. And then if you add the the beads coated with the kinesin to the microtubule in the presence of ATP, you'll see the glass bead move. And if it doesn't move, then that particular fraction didn't contain kinesin. And so you would take that fraction or those few fractions that do contain the kinesin and use those to continue with the purification until in the end you have totally purified squeaky clean kinesin. And you can determine that by running it on a protein gel and and seeing that there's only one protein there in the in the uh, in the fraction. In the case of trying to purify the scrapey agent, the scientists needed an assay synonymous with the microtubule gliding or the bead movement assay, so that they could determine where the infectious agent was in different fractions that they generated through their biochemistry. They knew 
from Gajashek's experiments that it took a year and a half for chimpanzees to show symptoms of Kuru when the chimpanzees' brains were injected with Kuru brain from human. And that time period was reduced, you'll recall, to a year when they injected disease brain tissue from chimp to chimp. But a year is a long time for a bioassay. It turns out that Prusner was able to develop a hamster model, and these hamsters developed symptoms of the disease 60 to 70 days after injection. But still, you need to take every single fraction that you generate in the biochemistry, and you have to inject it, each one of those, into its own hamster brain. And then you have to wait the 70 days to see which fraction contains the infectious agent. So there's a lot of animals, a lot of time, and a lot of work to pull off this experiment. The second problem is that it turns out when they try to biochemically purify the substance, so let me redraw a gradient. Uh, the gradients I've been drawing and we've been talking about so far in the class are called step gradients because we have a you know, 45% and it's a layer. And then on top of that, we put a 15% sucrose layer. And you just pipette the layers one on top of each other. It's pretty simple. But it turns out you can also uh, generate a gradient that doesn't have steps in it, but just gradually diminishes in concentration. So you could have a 45% down here, and then say up here at the top, it could be 5%. And then right below it is 6%, 7%, 8%, and 9%. It's just continue, continually increases in concentration. There's sort of a complicated way of, of the machine that generates this. You put a tube in here, and you float the 5% first, comes through the tube, and then it gradually increases, and the 5% moves up until the tube is complete, and you have 5% here, and like I said, 45% down here. So it's a continuous sucrose gradient. At any rate, they used a variety of different techniques to try to biochemically purify the scrapie agent, and like I said, at the end of the day, you have to inject each fraction into the brain of the hamster, and then you have to wait the 70 days to see whether the hamster comes down with the symptoms or not. So you'd have to uh, place the sample onto the gradient and then spin the gradient in a centrifuge, and then the different fractions would come into different spots along the continuous gradient. And then you can puncture a hole in the bottom of the test tube and collect fractions. So the first fraction would be the most concentrated stuff near 45%. And then you'd, the next tube would be a little less concentrated, you know, 44% uh, and so on. But at the end of the day, each one of these fractions has to be injected into a hamster, and you have to wait the 70-day period to figure out which sample contains the transmissible agent, that is, which, which one causes scrapie in the hamster. The problem is that they found that the scrapie agent is all over the place. It's in every fraction. And we'll see that there's an explanation for that in tomorrow's paper where we talk about fatal familial insomnia. I'll, I'll give you the upshot now. What happens is that the prion, which we now know is a protein, prion protein, they bind to one another and form aggregates. And if you have just a few molecules that are coming together to form an aggregate, like you know four or five molecules, then they're pretty small. And if they're made up of 50 or 100 protein, individual proteins making up the aggregate, 
then those are heavier, and then you can have some in the middle. So you end up with this protein that's really hard to purify because it aggregates with itself with other members of the same protein or gene product, and it forms different size aggregates uh, in the sample. We know that now. That wasn't known at the, at the time that Prusner wrote this article. Uh, so at any rate, there was a problem with the biochemistry that they couldn't easily purify it. But they did find a sample that was enriched for it. There was more of the transmissible agent in that fraction than in some of the others. And they removed that sample and they used that sample to try to assay what the nature of the transmissible agent is. So if we have our vial that contains the transmissible agent at high concentration, uh, they say that there are six separate lines of evidence that suggest that the transmissible agent contains a protein. One is proteinase K. So this is a protease, which cleaves the protein up into small amino acid sequence, so you're literally chopping it up. Uh, you can modify the protein with diethyl pyrocarbonate. You can denature it with SDS, which is a detergent. and activate it with kaotropic salts. This is like potassium iodide. It breaks up the proteins, breaks up the structure. And activate it with phenol. Or inactivate it with urea. All of these take apart secondary and tertiary structures of proteins. So if you treat this sample with any of these six chemicals that alter protein structure and then you inject each of those samples into its own hamster proteinase K diethylpyrocarbonate SDS and so on, none of these hamsters get scrapey. So by destroying the protein in the sample, you destroy the transmissible agent. Then they go on to treat the sample with RNases, things that destroy RNAs or DNAs. DNAs or an RNase, and some other reagents that attack these two types of molecules. And when they inject those into the hamsters, they still get the disease. So it looks like the transmissible agent does not contain RNAs, RNAs rather, or DNAs. It contains protein. So if we have our vial that contains the transmissible agent, they say that there are six 
So if we have our vial that contains the transmissible agent at high concentration, uh, they say that there are six separate lines of evidence that suggest that the transmissible agent contains a protein. One is proteinase K. So this is a protease which cleaves the protein up into small amino acid sequences. So you're literally chopping it up. Uh, you can modify the protein with diethyl pyrocarbonate you can denature it with SDS which is a detergent and activate it with chaotropic salts. This is like potassium iodide. It breaks up the proteins, breaks up the structure. And activate it with phenol or inactivate it with urea. All of these take apart secondary structures. All of these take apart secondary and tertiary structures of proteins. So if you treat this sample with any of these six chemicals that alter protein structure, and then you inject each of those samples into its own hamster, proteinase K, diethylpyrocarbonate, SDS, and so on, none of these hamsters get scrapey. So by destroying the protein in the sample, you destroy the transmissible agent. Then they go on to treat the sample with RNAs, things that destroy RNAs or DNAs. DNAs or an RNAs and some other reagents that attack these two types of molecules and when they inject those into the hamsters, they still get the disease. So it looks like the transmissible agent does not contain RNAs, RNAs rather, or DNAs. It contains protein. Finally, in table three, Please take a look at that when you have a chance. It's an important table, table three. Prusner shows that in order to inactivate the scrapie agent with UV irradiation, you need to irradiate it with 42,000 joules per meter squared. And in that table, he shows that viruses are inactivated with a much, much lower dose of UV radiation. So for instance, bacterial phage um, can be as low as four joules per meter squared radiation. And the toughest critter that they looked at was the potato spindle tuber viroid, which is inactivated or killed at 
5,000 joules per meter squared. So in doing so, Prusner proves that the prion disease, the scrapie agent, is not a slow-acting virus, but rather a protein that he named prion. Okay, everyone, that's it for today. Please stay safe and talk to you tomorrow.